You know, I think sometimes there's this pressure for pastors to always pretend like we get it right. <laughs> and when you get it wrong, you don't acknowledge it. But that's not true, so we're not going to pretend. And, and I, I just want to share some things that have been on my heart that I've been seeing more clearly. And they just need to be openly addressed. Okay, Because we can, over the course of time, my preaching and my understanding of the word has changed. Because guess what? We're not God. We, we are changing into the image he's created us in, okay? So if you're always changing, you're not going to be preaching the same thing. You're going to be growing, and you're going to be speaking the truth more and closely to his heart, amen? So God doesn't change. You change. You are coming out of darkness into light. Now, well, I said that wrong, okay? You have come out of darkness into light, and your understanding is being renewed, okay? Your understanding is being enlightened. So if it's being enlightened, that means it's not lighted yet, right? So you went from darkness to light in your spirit. Everybody say spirit. See, in spirit, we always talked about the new nature. We talked about what Christ did in you when you got born again. You're made in his image and his likeness. But uh, in years past, and I'm starting to see this more clearly, how many of you know that if you're going to follow God and you're going to be his disciple, you're called to a life of prayer? You're called to, you know, Jesus didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. So you're called to a life of prayer. You're called to a life of fasting. Everybody say fasting. See, we want to be his disciples and we don't want to fast, but he says my disciples will fast. So that's part of being a disciple is fasting. And you're just going to have to buck up and say, I know I don't like it right now, but he tells me I'm supposed to do it. Man, I tell you what, you may not like it at, at the beginning, but by the end, you're Man, the, you, God has just be able to speak to you so clear and you're, you feel so good physically anyway. I mean, God just, he just wants to bless you. And what part of fasting is just shutting down that side of you that's solely carnal and starting to listen to the spirit of God on the inside of you. Amen. So it's, it's create, it's, it's a forced war. All right. It's picking a battle. Say, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to listen to you body today. We're just not going to listen to you. And, and, and you start practicing saying no to your flesh, it's awesome practice for other things. Boy, it's awesome practice saying no to your flesh when it comes to food. And then when you get hit with a situation like sickness, no, I'm not listening to you today. You, don't understand, you understand what I'm saying? Because you are enforcing a spiritual truth that his stripes, his stripe bore your sicknesses. So I believe that in face of the pain that's preaching at me, okay? I don't allow the pain that preaches at me to override the truth that I'm not healed. I don't allow the addiction that's preaching to me that's been in my life as a personal experience all my life to preach to me and change the fact that he said you're free from sin. So if I don't allow what has been to preach to what should be, what difference does it make whether it's, whether it's healing, whether it's sin, whether it's, you know, you, maybe you're dealing with financial issues. Do you know that Jesus was made your prosperity? So you're heir with him. You have been made everything you need to be. Your mind needs to be renewed to catch up with the creative work of the Holy Ghost in your life when you got born again. And so I want to just acknowledge a little bit of being off, and I don't, I don't know where the line was at years past. Um, but in my understanding, I didn't see myself being what I needed to be. Anybody ever dealt with that? So I didn't preach from a perspective of sonship. I preached from a perspective of potential sonship. I preach from a perspective of, I know I am a son of God, but I don't always act like a son of God, and I don't always receive things like a son of God, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to worship all the things the word tells us to do. I'm going to do all of these things. And by my doing these things, I will become more of a son of God tomorrow than I am today. Now, all of those things are meant to bring transformation. But it's not a transformation of your spirit. Because the day you get born again, you are made in the image of Christ. You are a branch connected to the vine and the same sap that flows from God through Christ flows to you. There is no difference. Where are you going to draw the line between the root, the branch, and the vine? They're all one. And if you are born again, you are grafted into him. 
And what you do is you receive with meekness, James says, you receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your souls. It's your spirits? No, your souls. And that word is psyche. That's talking about your mind. It's able to save your souls. How? Why? No, Jesus saved your spirit, but saving your soul is a different process because you're renewed in the spirit of your mind as you take his word and his image of you and you superimpose and you eradicate everything that you used to be and you superimpose the image of Christ on the inside of you and you say, I receive from this place, not from that place. I receive as a son, not one trying to be a son. So in years past, Please, I'm telling you, I'm going to, I pray, I want, <laughs> I'm motivated to pray more, to fast more, to worship more than I ever have before. But don't worship, don't fast, and don't pray trying to ascend the mountain of sonship. Know that you have been accepted. You are accepted today. You're not deficient. Don't attack problems from a perspective of failure trying to become success attack problems from a perspective of i have been made success i have been made righteous i have been made the goodness of god and i have been created unto good works the good works don't create me so i don't have to pray in tongues 10 hours to become more like Christ. If I pray in tongues 10 hours, the whole point of the Holy Ghost coming was to illuminate my understanding that my soul might receive edification so that I could walk more in line of who I've already been made to be. Everybody with me? I feel like I'm explaining this pretty good. Okay, I'm listening. I don't don't come up, I don't have this written down, okay? I just, what he's teaching me, I'm, I'm sharing. And so don't, I can remember when I first started preaching here, I would talk about praying in the spirit and please continue to pray in the spirit. Don't, I'm telling you, you have no cop out to say, well, he said not to pray in the spirit (laughs) because I'm already Christ. Well, we're all still learning, amen? We're all still growing in knowledge. But what is growth? And see, I used to think, well, I had to grow in my spirit. I used to think that spiritually I was deficient. I wasn't like Christ yet, so as I continued to feed off of who he was, I'd become more like him. But you have to have a perspective that the day you get born again, you're a completely new creature. And maybe it sounds like I'm splitting hairs to you, but I'm telling you, if you have a perspective, everybody say perspective. This is important, this is a key word because a perspective is another word for a belief system. It's another word for Um, how you see yourself. So when you look in the mirror, how do you see yourself? If you see yourself as failure waiting to happen today because you failed yesterday, you're already set up with an expectation and a belief system that's going to empower you to walk in failure today. And Christ did not die and establish you as a a branch rooted in the vine to reestablish failure in your life. And to, he, he's always calling you forward and say, see who you are. See who you are now. See who you are now. And from that perspective of seeing who you are, if you read the epistles that Paul sent, Paul preached the same gospel to everybody. Didn't matter who it was. And so when you read from uh, you know, Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, almost every one of those epistles has a, it's like this potent, super condensed pill of the image of Christ in it. And you can find it in every one of them. And he'll say, put off the old and put on the new. And he'll define the old by the works of the old. And he'll say, don't walk in lasciviousness, don't walk in adultery, don't walk in fornication, don't walk in malice and hatred and and envy and strife. You put off all these things and become new. Love those that are around you. Speak truth with your neighbor, you know? Be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven you. So he puts one of these pictures. It's like a little image 
in every one of his epistles and he writes it to them and says, this is who you are now. So he doesn't tell them, make sure you spend a lot of time in prayer, even though he does admonish them to do that. What he's doing is he's delivering the revelation that he received of who you are. Everybody with me? He's delivering the picture of who Christ is in you and he's saying, this is who you are and you can walk like who he's made you to be. Amen? So that knowledge and that understanding is supposed to be the launching pad, the motivation. You have been redeemed from the world and you have direct access to God and there's nothing in between you and God. So the more I understand, the more I'm, the Holy Ghost is sent to teach you, right? That is his express purpose, to teach you. He really wasn't sent, how do I put this? In the, in the regenerative work of salvation, the Holy Ghost is the one that brings you from death to life, right? So if you were in sin and you bow the knee and say, I need a savior, the Holy Ghost is the one that quickens your spirit and makes you a child of God. But the work that allows him to do that was that Jesus had life. Nobody else had life. Everybody say life. So how can you have life without having life? See, you got a whole bunch of people that are lifeless trying to fake life, and only one had it, and that's Jesus Christ. And you can, you, you, it's not about which religion are you part of, it's who had the life, okay? It's not Muhammad and, and Buddha and, and Hare Krishna, or whoever else. There's only one that had life. Let's just get that settled. And his name is Jesus Christ. And if he's alive and everybody else is dead, and he chose to take the life that he had and say, I offer it freely, because he was the only one that could offer it freely, then I take what he gave me and I say, by grace I'm saved. And his life is mine now. And all of our life comes from him. So there's no difference between you and him the moment you get born again. I didn't used to really believe that. I believed we were made in his image. I would have said everything the same, but my perspective, everybody say perspective. I would have said everything the same, but my perspective was, yes, I know I'm a son of God, but I'm not quite there yet. What else is there there yet except what he gave me? How much, you know, you gonna be richer? <laughs> this isn't a pun based on my name, <laughs> okay? You gonna be richer than you used to be? You're going to be more healed than you used to be? You're going to be more free than you used to be? No, your mind is renewed to agree with the creation that's happened in you. Hallelujah. You don't give anything to make you more a son of God. He's made you a son of God. You don't pray to become more of a son of God. You are a son of God. Why do you pray? Why do you worship? Why do you fast? It is relationship and expression of relationship with God as your father. And as you're spending time with him, he doesn't continue to evolve you from a, you know, kind of a weak son of God into a mighty son of God. He is renewing your understanding, enlightening your understanding to let you know this is who you are. And the biggest battle that you're gonna have to get over every single person is to believe who you are is not who you used to be. And the only way you're going to believe that you're not who you used to be is to put a different image on the inside of you than the one that you've been believing all these years. The habits that you think you deal with, you only deal with because you don't believe you're a son of, or daughter of God. Everybody with me? This is very exciting. <laughs> I'm excited. That means the moment I understand something new about the life of Christ, it's mine to appropriate. Because if the Holy Ghost is enlightening me and teaching me from the place and perspective that I have been made a child of God, none deficient whatsoever, then every promise of the word has nothing to do with where I'm at in some kind of evolving spiritual development. What I receive from the word comes from the understanding that my mind is renewed according to who he made me already. So when I say I am the righteousness of God by Christ Jesus, I am agreeing with a new image of who I am, not the sin that I used to associate with. It's not a lingering problem. It's not a generational curse. There is no such thing. 
if you're in Jesus. Now, you may say my daddy dealt with this and his daddy dealt with that and you identify some kind of natural pattern. You tell me where that natural pattern finds its place in Christ. You tell me where Christ said, well, my daddy was a carpenter, so I got to be a carpenter. My daddy was a XYZ, so I got to be XYZ. His daddy was God. And that's it. And that's who you are. Amen. I have no idea where that leaves me in my notes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, okay, thank you, Father. Let's go to Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm so grateful that I've had the Holy Ghost as my teacher all these years. And I consider one of the greatest things he's taught me is how to see myself differently. I guarantee you that David in the natural wasn't looking at his stature, wasn't looking at his ability. What he was looking at when he went out and challenged Goliath you want to talk about mis mixed emotions? <laughs> I'm putting my life on the line here. I'm about ready to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody as tall as this ceiling. And they got all, they, they describe it. You remember they described the weight of the armor? They, I, did it, I, I did research on it. I think they said that, that um, the spearhead on that thing was something like 19 to 20 pounds. Now you, you, and the beam of that spear was like a weaver's beam. A weaver's beam was an inch radius, so two inches diameter. So you, can you imagine a pole this wide trying to be able to put your hand around it? You know, a broomstick's about like this. But you got a weaver's beam, it's about like this. And this guy handled it like a, you know, handled it like a broomstick. And it had a 20-pound head on it. <laughs> you don't think he, it wasn't for decoration, he'd throw that at you. I mean... There's a reason all that detail's in there. But we don't judge according to the flesh, we judge according to the spirit. And there's a reason he was able to go up there, stand toe to toe, and it's a type and a shadow of who you've been made to be. It don't matter. It could have been any single one of those guys. It should have been Saul himself. It wasn't because David was anointed. It wasn't because he was the future king. It was he was a kid that was humble enough to believe the covenant that God had with them as Israel. And he agreed that this guy has no right to be cursing and blaspheming us to our face. So he stood up to him. And you know the rest of the story. But I guarantee you, his boldness did not come from, I'm not, I'm not very strong and I'm not very big and I don't have as much firepower as that guy. His boldness came from his covenant with God. And you've got a covenant with better promises. Amen. Amen. And it's not a natural covenant. I don't go to war against you or go to war against another country to establish an empire for myself. I go to war with principalities and powers and spiritual things. Nobody, there's no right that the devil, no, no devil has any right to step foot in my house. I, I think this is for somebody. The devil can't come in and sneak up on you and make you do something that you don't want to do. Do you know that? He don't got to write into your house because of what somebody else did who lived there before or some dumb thing like that. If you're living there, then you are the elephant in the room. You are the 800-pound gorilla that he doesn't want to have to deal with. Take authority and be gone in Jesus' name. There's no devil in hell. Jesus said, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist, and he was the greatest of all men up till that point. You tell me, I, I'm telling you, a person that gets saved, born again, in an instant, they have enough authority to cast out every devil of hell that would come against them. Because they are an extension of the branch that is connected to the vine that is rooted in God himself. And you don't have to put up with it. Amen? So don't let, don't let some kind of fear or voodoo or, you know, I've had all kinds of weird dreams come to me. I had a dream come to me once 
a family member came and told me uh, in, a, in the dream, your wife had to die. This was a dream. Your wife had to die. If she did not die, you would have never understood the depth of love that God had for humanity. And because you've gone through this, God's love can pour out through you to heal. I had this dream. I woke up the next morning. I says, I rebuke you. You spirit of hell. Get out of my mind. That stuff don't work. That stuff don't work. You don't give your ear. Judge it by the word. Amen? Amen. Judge it by the word. There's one that died and nobody else is going to have to. Amen. Okay. Everybody, I'm not there. Everybody in 1 Corinthians 14. Okay, there we are. <clears throat> Follow after charity. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Follow after charity. Desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but to who? Unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifieth the church. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speak with, the, with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying <clears throat> now i went here because first off let me just put this in a box okay everybody paul is saying he's desiring that everybody prophesies all right you see that right he's calling everybody forward to prophesy to be able to illuminate to exhort to comfort the body of Christ as a whole. Everybody say, that means me. Uh, let's try that one more time. That means me. So every single one of you, Paul is putting this call out to the Corinthians. He says, I'm desiring that you and you and you and you and you and you and you be able to prophesy. Now, you can read before, he says, is everybody a prophet? No, the answer is not that everybody's a prophet. So because you prophesy doesn't make you a prophet. But everybody is called to prophesy. In other words, everybody is called to exhort the body of Christ that all may benefit. Amen? So what is the difference here? He says, follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he's speaking Mysteries, but he that prophesies speaks unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. What is the difference? He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that prophesies edifies the church. So when you are praying in the Spirit, in a sense, you are prophesying to yourself. Not that you understand everything that you're saying at the moment, but that you are by the Spirit speaking out the mysteries of God concerning your own life and your own edification. So as you spend time praying in the Spirit, you know, Jesus said, I'm going to send the Comforter and he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. So it stands to reason if the Holy Ghost was sent to teach each and every one of us, then there must be a means and a method by which he teaches us. And it stands to reason that if the Holy Ghost came, you know, Peter, the, the, the Jews, they said, we know that the Holy Ghost has fallen among the Gentiles because they all speak with tongues. So to the Jews and to the early church, praying in the Spirit was synonymous with the experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, if you've asked for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you can't pray in other tongues, don't Look on the outward and say, well, I must not have gotten it. You've asked for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Believe you receive it. Continue to take that stand because he, he says, how much more shall he give the Holy Ghost of them that ask him? So if you ask for the Holy Ghost, believe you receive him. Whether or not you pray in tongues or not, believe that you've received him by faith. But my Bible says you're going to pray in other tongues. Amen. So when you pray in other tongues, you're not speaking to men, you're speaking to God. 
So you are acting as a prophet of, not a prophet, as one that prophesies and edifies your own life. Okay? So when you're spending time praying in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost is trying to get across to you understanding of the Scriptures that you don't have yet. Who you are is the same, but he is trying to illuminate and edify you and teach you. And there have been times where all I've done is spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. But I would hit a situation and I would get a check in my spirit about going forward with it. And I tell you what, you save yourself so much trouble because you're spending time with the Holy Ghost praying things out that you don't know. Because I don't get in trouble. Because I don't, I don't let him, he won't <laughs> let me go forward without a witness that it's right or wrong. Amen. So follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. Now this is a slight rabbit trail on the, the main body of the message, but I believe that you each individually God wants to see the tremendous potential in each and every one of yourselves to be able to do what he's asking right here, to be an exhorter in the church, this church. Everybody say this church. To prophesy in this church. Because each and every one of you have a gifting. And each and every one of you, the body of Christ can't function with just one member or two members. And I don't mean that we don't have many members. But the body of Christ needs everybody's calling. And for callings to find their place in the body, it is the job of the local church pastor to affirm, call out, and encourage those giftings as they step forward. But it is also the job of every single person to spend time with the teacher so that they understand the vision that God has had for their life so that they can step out with confidence. And even if you don't have a pastor that is affirming your calling, God can affirm your calling and bring you forward, okay? You don't always have to have a pat on the back even though it's nice. <laughs> but ideally there should be a pastor that is encouraging and calling out your gifting as the Holy Ghost from within is pouring it forward from you. Everybody with me on that? So those two things, God needs you to take your place in the body. God wants you to step up and be able to benefit everybody. I think it's, uh, I believe it's at the end of 14 here. Let me see, I've got it bookmarked over here. Go to verse 11. Oh, sorry, not 11, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 31. For you may all prophesy. Everybody say all. all. All means all. It doesn't mean... See, and we're not talking about the office of a prophet here. We're talking about prophesying. That means giving inspired, inspired speaking, inspired direction from the Holy Ghost for the benefit of the body as a whole. Okay? so that God is able to pour through you. And that's what's the blessing in the New Testament. The, it used to be that it was just the prophet, right? It was just the office of the prophet that could talk to God. But the, what Joel saw and what the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was, your old men, your, your young men, your handmaidens, your servants, your daughters, your sons, all of you are vessels for, that the Holy Ghost can use to speak through. That's what this outpouring is when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. Okay, and, and now there is a right order to doing that, but that's not what we're talking about here. It's just that I want everybody to feel and believe that and have confidence that God can talk through you. It doesn't matter how eloquent you are or how many times you've done it before, but God can use you. Everybody say use. God can use you because you're his son or his daughter and have confidence in who he's made you to be. And when you look in the mirror, you don't see somebody that's not ready. You see an extension of God on the earth. Amen. 
view yourself as an extension of God on the earth. Don't say, well, I'm not ready for that. You're ready for that. You're ready for that, amen? If you, so, I believe there's so much potential sitting here. There's so many people that understand so much of the word. God just wants to bring new life to it and step you out into what you're called to do. Because everything you understand about who God is and who you are can be walked out because your mind has been renewed to it. The worst kind of deception that you can fall to is being someone that knows much but does little. That knows a lot about God and believes that because they know a lot about God, they're bearing much fruit just by virtue of the fact that they know. That's not how fruit is born. Fruit is born by obeying the truth that you understand. So in spite of all of your knowledge about how someone is to get saved, if you never ever crossed enemy lines and say, you need Jesus. Now, maybe that's not how you're supposed to deliver it, but you're eventually going to have to take a step and say, is it okay if I pray with you? Is it okay that God wants to heal you of that? I have faith that he will. Just like David standing up and saying, I don't know who you are, but I know who my God is. Amen? Because if you got that kind of boldness and trust, it's going to promote action in your life. Everybody say action. All right, everybody with me still? All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter one. This one and one other one, and as far as I know, I think we'll be done. Ephesians chapter one. We'll start here in verse 15. Wherefore I also, Paul, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you my prayers. Ephesians 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Everybody say revelation. In the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, illuminated, opened, okay? That you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us. Everybody say us. us. To us, word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. I just had a funny thought. You, you know, you've been a Christian for all these years, and I'm talking to me. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Day's the same. But someday you're going to, the Holy Ghost just, you're spending time praying, spending time getting to know him. I love you, Father. I worship you. Just talking to him, you know. It's relationship. It's not formula. And it's going to dawn on our understanding the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word. And it's just going to be like, oh my goodness, you just won the lottery. <laughs> Could you imagine, imagine, would your life change if you got a letter in the mail? You get, well, not today, okay, tomorrow. But you got, t- tomorrow, you got a letter in the mail that says, uh, you, sorry, you, we, we couldn't find you, took a while to track down, but you have a very, 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 very rich uncle, and now you're a billionaire. Would that change your life a little bit? Would you kind of just sit there and say, oh, man, that's interesting. <laughs> I think you'd probably... Even the most reserved person would probably stand up and say, glory, hallelujah. (laughs) Do a little bit of jumping and dancing, calling some people. One day, see, this is what he's praying for. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I hope you see this. He's saying this. I hope you see it like I see it. That the God of our 
Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward you, usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. And he just keeps going on and on. And later on he says, and you hath he quickened. He, he set you at his own right hand in Christ Jesus. And he's saying this, I really hope you get this in your spirits the way I see, I see our inheritance. You won the spiritual lottery. And it, it's like that revelation has to come to here and replace everything you think you know about yourself. Because I'm telling you, Jesus walked in the revelation of who he was, not the way things were. Jesus is perfect theology and everything he did was authored by God. Everybody he touched was healed. And we're supposed to be like Christ. Amen. We'll do one more. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Part of Paul's commandment to the churches was not only to mark people that caused division. I mean, how could you imagine that? <laughs> you, <laughs> you're causing division. Stop it. Beware of that one, okay? <laughs> but he says, mark those that cause division. But he also says, mark those that are an example of Christ, okay? Um. I don't want to cut off in the middle of this thought. We're we're just going to do a little bit of reading here. Philippians 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. (laughs) I'm just talking about people here, okay? (laughs) Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Praise God. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he hath thereof, I, that he might trust in the flesh, I more. He's like, if you want to compare that, I could, I could beat you, but, but that's not what I'm standing on, okay? He was the cream of the crop, the most educated, the most, he was who you needed to be to be holy with God in the old covenant circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness was in the law, blameless. In other words, he kept the code. If he made a mistake, he did the appropriate sacrifice. He kept it. But what things were gained to me, that I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I hope I can explain this right. I feel okay to share it. I was reading through this verse the other day and it hit me what he meant. Because I always thought, you know, he says, well, it's not my own righteousness. It's not my own works. It's I just count on the work of Christ. That's the way I always read it. And that's not wrong, okay? But what he's really saying there is, I used to derive my righteousness from keeping the law and I used to bear the fruit of keeping the law. But now he's saying, I derive my righteousness from the faith of Christ and my faith in Christ produces righteousness. He's not saying, I don't have to try anymore. That's what we often hear. I hope I'm making sense. He's not saying, oh, it's not by works. You don't have to try. Just give up. You'll never be as good as you need to be. He's not saying that. 
What he's saying there is the law produced a certain kind of righteousness and I don't trust it because it can't change me. But I have been changed and now that change produces the work of faith in me and good works of righteousness come out of this faith in Christ Jesus. He's not saying forget trying, just count on Jesus. He's saying your foundation has shift, shifted from the law to grace and what the law could not do grace has given you the power to walk free from sin and be righteous in everything does that make sense he's not saying don't try anymore you can't try you'll never make it although you can't earn righteousness he's not saying just give up he's saying i be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of christ the righteousness that is produced which is of god by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now he's not talking about earning salvation. What he's, that word there is the only time it's used. Resurrection is out resurrection. It is talking about a while alive here in this life, there is a manifested expression of the power of God that's from another world okay not as though I had already attained either were already perfect but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus brethren I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind everybody say forget he didn't dig up his skeletons in his closet he didn't go and try and work through all of his pain in his childhood. He didn't go try and atone for his sins that he committed while he killed the church. He says, I forget. Everybody say, forget. You count yourself dead, and he says, I'm trying to conform to the death of Christ so that the power of God can be alive in me today. Count yourself dead and alive to God. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded. Everybody say minded. minded. Be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal. Everybody say reveal. How does he reveal to you if you're minded in the wrong way? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? If you're minded in the wrong way towards a situation, the Holy Ghost is there to reveal to you. All right? <clears throat> Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto you have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so that you have for an example. I don't pray in the spirit, I don't fast, and I don't worship to get more from God. I pray in the spirit, I fast, and I worship to understand who he made me to be and to be able to receive it by faith, not by works. Amen? Amen. You are a new creature. Let's end this with a, a confession. If you agree with it, you can say it. If you don't, don't. I'm going to say it ahead of time, okay? I'm going to start. You guys follow. I am the righteousness of God by faith in Christ. I am no less a son or a daughter than Paul, than Peter, than John, than Jesus, because I have been made in his image. I don't have to work for it. That's my starting line. I start with the life of Christ. I pray, I worship, and I fast to understand, to renew my mind, to understand, and to renew my mind, to go where I haven't been, to be what he's called me to be. I thank you, Father, that I'm not trying to be a son of God, a daughter of God. I am a son or a daughter of God. 
and all of the things I do that constitute relationship are for me to understand more about who you've made me to be. Amen. Well, if you start yourself with that perspective every morning, could you imagine waking up victorious in the morning? You're not dependent on situations. You're already free to, to walk more in Christ. We have to start seeing ourselves differently. See yourselves differently, and it's going to change how you walk, how you talk, how you think. It'll change how you pray. It'll change how you pray. Because it's not based on who you are. It's based on who he is. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Well, Father, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you're helping us understand these things. I thank you that... <clears throat> I thank you that you shift and tweak our perspectives. I thank you that we, first and foremost, are founded on the foundation of who Jesus was and who you've made us to be.